So we'll start with the positive. Elliot? Do you want to stand up? No. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, right. I think this side understands that the world is not fair. All right. We realise that we cannot just simply vote our way to a better society. We have a lot of evidence from the past which. We have a lot of evidence from the past which proves that constantly trying to just vote in better leaders to create a better society does not work. This, there's no historical precedent for a socialist society being created through a democratic What you need, through democratic parliamentary means, what you need is a revolution, a revolution of the people to rise up and overthrow this kind of bourgeoisie system that we live in now. You know, the capitalists are not going to give up power peacefully. We need to take it from them by any means necessary. Okay, it's so you claimed initially that there is no historical precedent for societies being improved and progressing towards socialism through democratic reformist means. But that totally ignores the history of virtually the entire Western world. I don't think anybody would seriously claim that Britain is as oppressive, as undemocratic, as bad and oppressive a work now as it was in the 1850s. Now, have we undergone a revolution? No. Through democratic, reformist, gradualist means, we've improved society through the democratic process. Now, have we achieved socialism? No. And that's for a number of reasons we can go over. Essentially, the working class has mobilised and has fought through uh, parliamentary institutions to improve society. Uh, and has improved society gradually and continues to do so. The point is that, the point is that while the reformists have reformed society gradually, revolutions achieve not only not improving society, but in every country where a revolution has occurred, it's made it far, far worse. And if we look at the history of revolution, we can see this is true in uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you seriously claim that the USSR improved under socialism, China, Cuba, Albania, Yugoslavia, so all of these countries far, far far under socialism. Not only, not only were the people um, brutally oppressed by their governments, but uh, not only were they oppressed by their governments, but they failed to achieve uh, even the modest economic uh, improvements and the growth in the past were achieved in liberal democratic capitalist societies. I'll say the essential problem of the revolution is this. Revolution is a theory of change that relies on the elite that are currently in control of society being replaced by another elite. Now, in the case of the French Revolution, that elite was uh, rising uh, sans, the sans culottes, the uh, emergent bourgeoisie, seizing power in a violent revolution, and then murdering those who ruled before them. Uh, now, in the case of Marxist revolutions is typically an elite of intellectuals seizing power from the elite rule before them and using violence of the state, using violence of the state to eliminate any opposition to their rule. The second point is that revolution is inherently elitist, inherently anti-democratic, and proceeds against the will of the people. So in summary, I would say this. Fight for socialism, convince people to support socialism, implement socialism democratically without the mass murder. Uh, mass starvation or the destruction of nations. Revolution does not have to be violent. <laughs> Could you give an example of a non-violent revolution? That would be a revolution. That's not a revolution in music. Let's have a revolution through the music shop. Alright. So, um, yeah, so we've heard from both sides and now kind of if if we all just like put our hands up and then I'll, I'll come to you because that if we're all talking over each other it's uh, quite difficult to have a we proper discussion. Side by side. No. no, just I mean oh. just I mean you can still sit there, Josh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, Thomas, do you have something to say? Yeah, okay. So Felix's argument on that we've seen liberal capitalism and uh, capitalist reforms have taken us to a better and better society, so therefore, you know, we can keep on doing this. Yeah. 
Fundamentally, we have to look at actually why those reforms emerge. A lot of these reforms, in fact, in most cases, can be reforms in the capitalist class, needing to basically try and drive the working class not to revolt. For example, the reforms you see uh, throughout the 50s and 60s, etc. Uh, you know, creation of large welfare states um, to ensure that you know, the working class don't go up and uprise. Or uh, let's say you see in the Americas in Ukraine, uh, let's say large households which are heavily indebted, so they then don't want to go and rise, give people houses so they change the system. Because I think similar things should be debt. And you also see this uh, through more progressive reforms, for actually class antagonisms. So, for example, um, if you take a look at, let's say, your battles in uh, the 1850s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, the battle over the election of the working day, working class movements get together um, in union, or very basic unions at that time, to actually go and progress uh, for a longer and long, uh, shorter and shorter working day. Um, and this is how actually capitalist reforms develop. The capitalist class is in no need uh, to, let's say, just give reforms for the sake of it. They don't you know, look at poor people and say, well, I could be really rich. Um, or I could, you know, help this person out. No, they go, well, I could be really rich. It's the definition of being a capitalist. Those capitalists who go, well, no, I'll help people out, quickly get beaten in the market, quickly are not able to continue being capitalists and are replaced by more brutal, more effective capitalists. Would you, would you recognise the, um, kind of the point that the other side might make in a second, that um, perhaps then... Um, in response to what, in light of what Felix said, kind of, we're in an almost paradoxical position where we've seen from past um, attempts that a, a, a violent overthrow and immediate kind of socialist revolution um, likely won't work in the long term, but we need to be in a position where the capitalists see that we're ready to have a revolution, um, to have the impetus to be forced to make reform. No, and you can actually see this is happening right now. We've created the current crisis emerging after 08, which is, uh, hasn't been solved in anything. It's put capitalism at an impasse. It cannot uh, go and give any more demands. If you really want to see this, you just have to look at what's happening to the current NHS. The fact that the Tory government are being forced to reform capitalism in such a way that they've managed to anger not working class people, not poor revolutionaries, not you know, young people like that. They've managed to go and piss off doctors <laughs> that they have a strike. This isn't something you know, that the Tory government was like, oh yeah, we want to do. No, but instead they don't. They're being forced to by the hand of capital. And this is the position that they're going in. Now, yes, if we have another boom era, let's say we've had in the 60s and 70s, then you can see more and more reforms. Let's actually look at where this boom could come from. Uh, currently, economic, um, the bourgeois economists are completely out of options. They're trying more and more mad ways to try and stimulate the economy, and they're completely failing. Cute, uh, quantitative easing, low interest rates, um, expanding to other markets, etc. They've all completely failed, and that's you so seeing how the IMF yesterday reduced global growth down even further than it already did. So you'd say that capitalism is under such strain that kind of the, the time is right for, for a revolution. Yeah, um, yeah, there's no order. Josh, I'll come to Carl in a sec. Uh, you had your hand up. Um, first of all, I think most people in this room would agree that austerity is a political choice. Uh, and it's not even widely considered the best political choice. There's, it's completely contrary to Ke uh, Keynesian economics, uh, where you stimulate the, the economy rather than take money out of it. Um, but on your point about unions about the driving of growth, surely a market successful society is one where it has the institutions and the facilities to respond to internal pressures with, with things like unions and political parties uh, that can let the government, let the ruling parties know what reforms need to be taken. And the fact that they have been taken, regardless of how they do it, surely shows that we have the facility to do it in our society. We should carry on with that. Yeah, good. Um, how do you still have a... All right, we'll come back to the other side. Um, I'm sure that this side... Both sides, this side would argue that sort of reformism is a sort of compromise where you can achieve satisfying the working class and creating a better society whilst maintaining a sort of um, PC structure or safety that we supposedly need. Or, and I heard Felix's words anti democratic, suggesting that revolutions sort of go against our democratic rights and needs. Well, given the fact that we don't live in a democracy and there is a major Western power that's created a total democracy, uh, I don't think you can really 
say revolutions are anti-democratic. I mean, I don't think anyone in here is bathed in favour of a sort of minority and an elite having a revolution. I, I think we all argue for a revolution of the people. And I certainly would say that revolutions in many ways are an instance of a disenfranchised uh, group of people and a disenfranchised majority usually claiming their right to democracy. Felix? Um, yeah, I, I think you raised some interesting points. The idea that for an instance democracy is something that I used to or I argued for in here many times, but ultimately we do essentially have the, the, okay, there are serious problems with democracy in mm-hmm. capitalist society with democracy in the rest of the Western world, right? We know it's influenced by big money, by lobbyists, by corporations, but fundamentally we still do have the ability to vote for who we choose to. Now that process is influenced and shaped by capitalist elites, but at base it is ultimately people who are voting. We ultimately have a free press. We have the ability to control societies, and in fact, the societies that we live in, the Western world, the Western Europe, are the most democratic societies that have ever been created by humans. Uh, now, you say that you want a revolution not run by elites, but run by the people, and yeah, okay, I'm sure everyone in here would say, we don't want some blanquist coup. We want a general, a democratic revolution, bottom up, led by the people. And that's a great idea. It's a great idea, in theory. But in practice, the only serious way to seize power from, especially from a modern, developed, industrial nation state, is to have revolutions led by people. You can't have this aimless revolution where you have different groups of people, different sections of society, all running around aimlessly, trying to seize power and hindering each other. You have to have an organized, seizure of power, and essentially a coup, um, pro- presumably one that the army supports, and then you need to have people to take control of state institutions and transform them. And that's where the problems were. Because as soon as you have an elite seizing power of state machinery, especially in the stresses of at least revolution, if not all that civil war, then they lose connection from the people. And as we've seen time and time again, in revolution after revolution, they ultimately seek the benefit of themselves rather than the people. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, if you consider kind of the, um, the the level of consciousness and fervor that would be required for a completely bottom-up revolution of the masses, it's, um, I, it's, as you were saying, it's kind of unrealistic. And so naturally, out of an attempt to have a successful revolution, because you, know, you can generate um, quite a strong revolutionary sentiment, but in, in that like urge to win the revolution, elites form, and, um, and yes, uh, that's how the revolution's failed. Does the other side have a point against that? You and I have loads. <laughs> well, you've spoken already, um, so, Elliot. Um, okay, so I think, Cyrus, you, you made the point that, oh, uh, bottom-up revolutions require a lot of people, and I think that's true, but I think also, Reform requires a lot of support. It requires a majority of support, if not more, with our electoral system. You know, you need millions and millions of people to support your cause, and you have the bourgeoisie media pushing against it. You have the establishment pushing against it, saying, no, you shouldn't vote for these people. You should be voting for Tories, UKIP, any other capitalist system. Reform takes ages. It takes a long, long time. And while we're in here debating, or while the House of Commons is debating austerity, there are people out there on the streets, there are innocent kids, millions, one in six kids in the UK living in poverty. You know, we could we can sit around debating whether, oh, you know, I think that socialism is good for this reason, oh, I think that we should vote in people for this reason. But that takes a long time, and people who are suffering do not have that time to waste. We have to act. So we can help those people as soon as we can. We can't live in a society which hurts those people, and we can't let that society carry on. Anyone other than Felix and Josh? Not. Um, yeah, Felix the last, said Josh. Um, first of all, a big part of that time is actually going through the debate, reasoning through the different kinds of debate, how best to deal with that. That is important. We can't just disregard that. But let's look at some, like, some historical examples of revolution. Um, the French Revolution, which was the cause, you know, decades of, of war and crisis in Europe. The American Revolution was essentially a 
a war between Britain and France. The Russian Revolution was led by an elite and was essentially an elitist revolution. So there's, there's no precedent for the kind of mass popular revolution that you're talking about. Thomas? Okay, so first of all, a couple of points. Uh, on this whole idea of kind of, kind of going to disagree with Elliot and like disagree with Felix both at the same time, <laughs> what does it think of? Uh, on this whole idea of democracy, uh, and what does it actually mean to have democracy in the capitalist system? And I would agree, yes, in many ways we do have democracy. If, let's say, there was a big campaign, um, and by some magic we all got together, Corbyn could be elected. You know, the bourgeois press will try their best and say, you know, look, he's old, he's horrible. <laughs> And everyone be like, yeah, he is, isn't he? Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, we could get elected. There's not going to be some then military coup. Very, very unlikely. And then let's actually consider this process. Say, you know, Corbyn gets elected. Uh, or, you know, a revolutionary leader. For example, Syriza. Yeah, you know, group of Marxists, basically. They were split from an, um, an outright communist party. What happens when they get into the power of bourgeois government? They are forced by the nature of capitalism to become with the bourgeoisie, the kind of bourgeoisie themselves, to enact these reforms to strengthen capitalism. Because unless you fundamentally change the whole economic base of capitalist system, you have to go along to improve capitalism. Because as soon as capitalism starts failing, as soon as the rich aren't getting rich, as soon as profit rates begin to fall, which is based off the exploitation of the working class, and effectively as soon as you stop exploiting the working class, um, capitalism begins to self-destruct. And the capitalist system needs to be reformed. It can't, uh, it can't handle this reform. It can't abide, which is why time and time again you see left-wing governments swing to power and impose the exact same reforms that the right-wing were going to do. Just British politics and less of that. Now, I've got being Josh is going to come up and say, oh, yes, but look at the 60s, etc., then, and the welfare state. And like, yes, I'd agree, but those were under very specific economic conditions when capitalism was in a position where it could grow and we could support this. Mainly because it was going out and exploiting the third world, mainly because there had been a huge uh, war which had allowed markets, uh, which had um, decreased wages. So, unless again you're arguing for you know, another world war, that isn't a possibility. Finally, on this point about a revolution being democratic, then I'll shut up. Um, you know, this whole thing that, oh yeah, it's always going to be an elite, it's always going to be a tiny minority which goes in and seizes power. And yet, yeah, that has a lot of precedence. We have all seen, let's say, what happened. But actually, let's look at what do we mean when we say the socialist revolution. We mean workers coming together and taking control, uh, control of their own workplaces and stuff like this. There are many ways in which you set this out, in which this doesn't become undemocratic. Now, I actually say that Russia is a very good example of this. Uh, the only problem is, is that the Russians didn't consider peasants non-workers, because they weren't workers, and so they didn't have that much democracy. If you actually look at the workers' councils, the Soviets, are coming up. These were incredibly democratic organisations which ended up taking power. Now, completely bad. It was completely wrecked by the whole idea of the, um, you know, the civil war and then another war and then just, you know, Stalin. And then it, it, it disintegrated very, very quickly. But beforehand, you have democratic organisations coming together. The idea of factory committees, of Soviets, of workers leaving them out. This doesn't have to be fundamentally undemocratic. Okay, um, Ziggy? Just sort of pointing out, I think our idea of revolution here is quite sort of old fashioned. We're all sort of seeing men in caps with guns. And I don't think that's necessarily what modern revolution can be. It's not necessarily sort of violent or whatever. I mean, it might be. But there are many different forms of revolution, and some of them can be social change and ideological change. And I think just saying like revolution is just people going around blowing things up and shooting. But then where do you draw the, um, the distinction between a reformist kind of process and a revolutionary process? I'm saying that there's kind of an in-between which nobody sort of... Um, it's not sort of as black and white, this is revolution, this is reform. There's stuff going on between the two which can have an effect or not have an effect. I agree, but then wouldn't you... Like, so are you proposing kind of um, non-violent revolution in the sense of kind of... So, but what would you say, like, are these kinds of forms of revolution that aren't violent, as in, like, passive, like, peaceful um, disobedience, or...? I'm not into hippie stuff, so I don't... <laughs> 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 Elliot, yeah? Um, okay, so, so, multiple times you've said, oh, well, the revolution is 
led by an elite, and then it, it obviously the regime or the whatever turns into the elite's interest. Yet you're proposing the exact same thing. You're proposing voting for a party and then to put in a government which is effectively an elite, which will pursue its own interests. I mean, we saw this even in 1945, Clement Attlee's government, you know, heralded it as the greatest left-wing government the UK has ever had, made the NHS and constructed the welfare state and all of that. Yet still, it was crushing workers' strikes. It was still doing stuff that it, it was in its own best interest. And that will always happen when you have a representative democracy and you're voting in representatives. They will pursue their own interests over the interests of the workers. Sorry, I don't know your name. In what sort of, what, like, what kind of things would you oh, like to see? Because it's, it's very difficult in our voting system to try and get a fair vote, I think, yeah. on, on our, generally. And um, as long as we change that, there won't be such an elitist establishment that we've got at the moment. So you're talking more about, like, proportional representation yeah. and increasing the yeah. voter turnout and things like that? <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, that was quite brief, though. So, well, I guess we'll go to the back there. So the welfare state is kind of keeping the, <coughs> keeping the workers healthy for the bourgeois and public transport brings the workers to the bourgeois' front door and, well, you yeah, know, and argue that appeases sort of, the masses. It keeps the, it keeps the workers docile. Yeah, okay. Um, Felix? Uh, okay. I think by now I've probably forgotten half the points I was going to supply to, but uh, briefly, democracy, I think... The main, well, I don't think the socialists we can really even begin to argue against democracy, given that socialism, to me, is right. democracy. I mean, what is socialism but democratic control of the workplace, and more democratic control over how uh, resources are distributed in society, and how society. 
society is run with more than one particular community is more than one in the workplace. So, as socialists, I don't think we can really say we want a system that's almost total democracy, but to achieve that system, we want to use anti-democratic means, because that, to me, doesn't make any sense. The struggle has to take the form of the society we want to create. Uh, Secondly, Elliot's point, uh, I think about ages ago now, about reformism takes an incredibly long time, we want a revolution now. Well, that's easy to say, but okay, great, let's have a revolution, let's get on with it. Well, I think you find that 99.9% of the British class aren't really very keen on rushing to the barricades, seizing the means of production, seizing power from the state. Secondly, even if we do agree, even if we do have a majority of the working class willing to seize power from the state, well, we have a more than developed industrial nation state. I don't think it's going to peacefully hand over the keys to power. Really, the only way you can do it is to come to the army to support you. And as we've seen in Britain, the army is a bastion of reactionism. I think, I mean, I think we've seen a really good example of um, how revolution plays out in practice. We've seen in the Arab Spring. People rise up against their governments, they unite, they fight against them, and in several instances, they're brutally repressed, and it develops into all that civil war. Uh, a final point is that I don't want to sound too much like a conservative. <laughs> 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 but, I'm going to say it anyway. Britain, for all its flaws, and I spent half my life arguing about its flaws, is almost the best society that humans have created. We have a developed, well, I mean, you're more, but we have a developed welfare state. We look after the poor. We have freedom yeah, of assembly. So well. well, more than any society in human history, I would argue. We don't have people dying on the streets, we have the NHS. It's not. We d- well, it's not. Okay. <laughs> so again, again, Interruptions, guys. Can you compare the present day UK to this idealised utopian village where nobody dies and everybody's happy and we have full communism? We should compare it to the reality of other states in the world. We have strong institutions, we have democratic society, we have the welfare state. We are essentially more developed, happy, healthy, and free than any other society in human history ever. Yeah, but the main reason okay. that no other societies are as good is every kind of vaguely left-wing society that worked reasonably well has sprung up in the last sort of 50, 60 years. The Americans have just destroyed it yeah. through causing military failures <coughs> or invading them. Well, I'm not Felix, in my opinion, um, at the back of there. You don't like it, Jeff. I don't like it. I said, I said good, good jobs, you know, watch the tape. I'm just trying to be friendly. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, I mean, you pointed out the thing with the Arab Spring. Um, I think that is one example of a system that's failed for a long time. And it's the How do we fix it, Thomas? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I find this like, I would like to say, a really good argument. But I think we've just got to really tackle this point. Like, firstly, a reformism and the idea that we'll get to a. Okay, like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's just come back and fix this point that society's pretty daffy. And yes, we are at the height of uh, human civilization. Probably London is probably the currently greatest city on the earth. You could make a good argument for it. Oh, but that's not a high bar to reach <laughs> when you consider all the immense things that humans can do, and then we're stuck with a system which doesn't allow for a great amount of human progress. Let's just take a couple of look at some of the problems Britain faces. Currently, economic stagnation, growth has almost completely stopped, debt is currently growing, and we're in an almost terminal crisis. You know how long? The IMF. So this isn't a left-wing propaganda type thing. This is, you know, the height of bourgeois thought. They predict this current crisis could go on the, up for over a hundred years. It won't stop. None of us will ever be alive in a period of economic growth. Up 
Michael can, uh, I call it this joke, well, let's say 20 or 30. It's, you know, uh, our society is completely undemocratic, and this gets back to my point, you know, um, so it probably raises a good idea. Of why, why can't we just, you know, have a fair voting system, or, or he can say, why don't we just get rid of white, white ringers, and then everything will be okay. Uh, however, what this completely ma uh, ignores is the fact that our current society isn't unjust because there's some evil people at the top who are just like, money, yes, aha. No, it's because of the fundamental economic structure of the system which is based for exchange requires constant crisis, requires exploitation of the poor, requires this vast antagonism for rich against the poor. This is what um, you have just from the very basic principles of having a society based for exchange. The idea that we could reform to some socialist utopia is completely utopian in itself. It doesn't uh, take account of the econ underlying economic realities of the capitalist system. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> well, future and too uncertain for a, a self-respecting bourgeois capitalist to kind of invest in. So in that sense, I'd really say. Briefly, that's really small because a huge amount of the research and development that occurs within capitalist society is actually driven by, by the state, yeah. not by private yeah. investors. And actually, yeah. American economic success, a huge extent is due to the fact that the American military spends a fucking huge amount of money it's on developing technology and then it just like gives it to the private sector. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> I, I'm really struggling with the idea. 
of how are you going to turn this into a really, actually democratic revolution? How are you going to get so much support for this revolution from so many different aspects of society, from a great number of people?